the ancient Chinese brought inventions into existence that changed the world forever. Machines built on a scale and level of sophistication that was unrivaled for millennia. Many of their inventions redefined engineering. But perhaps their most lasting legacy lies in one area, a sphere of technological innovation in the field of war. At over 6,000 years old, China is one of the planet's most ancient civilizations and today boasts the largest army in the world. 60 centuries of military heritage has left an incredible legacy of technologically advanced weapons. Now, new discoveries are making us realize that much of what we thought we invented actually existed thousands of years ago. Armies that used handguns, landmines, and massive attack catapults to destroy whole towns. Lethal flamethrowers that rained fire on the attackers. High velocity cannons and lethal incendiary bombs that blasted whole battalions out of existence. And even self-propelled missiles. Machines of war that would be instantly recognizable to the frontline troops serving in today's armies. Most of the, the weaponry used in modern warfare has its roots originally in China. Chinese military innovators were thousands of years ahead of their time. The Chinese throughout a lot of history have been at the absolute cutting edge of military technology. Incredibly, their use of gunpowder and military rockets is stunningly similar to the way we use them in battle today. It's certainly one of their major contributions, for better or for worse, to the history of the world. There's no doubt that through a lot of history, the Chinese have been the greatest military innovators on Earth, and their technology ha has certainly been at the absolute forefront. In 400 BC, China was not a unified country. Several states existed in the area, and they were all trying to take control. The state that could take control of its neighbors would win the greatest prize, domination of China. And to beat their neighbors in battle, the Chinese military engineers accelerated the development of killing machines. In the Bronze Age, around 800 BC, Warfare in China relied on hand-to-hand -hand combat and the sword. Chinese blacksmiths were producing amazing advances in metalworking. The result was an array of axes, knives, and swords, the most lethal blades the world had ever seen. The craftsmanship that went into a Chinese sword was extraordinary. They forged iron with carbon to produce ultra-hard blades set into hilts of exquisite craftsmanship. They used an ingenious approach to cooling the blade in the forge, where the middle was coated in a heat-resistant substance that allowed the edge to cool quicker than the middle. The result was a very strong and very sharp weapon. As their skill with metal grew, so did the length of the blades they could produce. In the kingdom of Qin, swords became longer, about 36 inches, and this gave a good advantage in combat. The longest swords in Europe at the time were only 27 inches long. To make long swords, advanced technology was needed to assure their sharpness and flexibility. Swordsmiths had mastered the chemical properties of metal, in particular chromium plating, an extremely complex chemical process. The result was an incredible level of hardness and durability. The sword still shines and has not gone rusty after 2,200 years. This is a result of the chromium plating on it. How could the Chinese swordsmiths have coated the eight-sided blades with this chromium? With no electricity 2,200 years ago, the chromium plating must have been done by a chemical method. Something rich with chromium was wiped on the weapons or the weapons were buried with chromium and heated up. The answer is still a mystery. But even after 2,000 years, the swords have the cutting precision of a modern-day razor. 
At point-blank range, a trained swordsman could deliver the point of the sword into an enemy with a force of 3,000 pounds, enough to drive through armor, flesh, and bone. Each sword has eight surfaces, and every line on each surface is beautifully crafted. The most important thing is that the blades are really sharp. This is actually as sharp as a razor. At the Tangxi Sword Factory in Keping, modern craftsmen are still creating these exquisite weapons in the same way they were crafted two millennia ago. The iron is forged in furnaces heated to 1130 degrees, just using air and charcoal. The sword is then pounded with a heavy hammer. This flattens the sword into a very thin blade and also hardens the metal. This process, known as tempering, is repeated time and time again. At each stage, the sword becoming harder, thinner, and more deadly. Attention is paid to the smallest details on the beautiful hilts, and the result is an exquisite creation, part work of art, part deadly weapon. But were there even longer blades wielded in ancient China? Dr. Tom Richardson is curator at the Royal Armouries in Leeds, England. The armouries boast one of the largest collections of rare military hardware on the planet. Here lies one of the most unique weapons of the ancient world, a dagger axe. It was called the Ge, this beautifully engineered, pointed, bladed weapon was originally fastened onto a 10-foot staff. The dagger axe inflicted massive punishment over two and a half thousand years ago. Today, only the bronze blade itself remains. The uh, fluke at the back of the blade passes through the haft, and the slots here on the back of the blade uh, are intended to bind the blade onto the haft. The weapon's precision design ensured that the blade could be used to maximum effect in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Each blow would deliver a force of 6,000 pounds. To be on the receiving end of just one thrust would have been agonizing. They're swung on very long hafts, and you can imagine the concussive impact of one of these blades swung on the end of a long pole. By 1000 AD, China was over a 1,000 years old and had consolidated her military might. Her engineers and blacksmiths were becoming expert at creating deadly weapons. But it was the chemists and alchemists who stumbled across a mixture that would completely rewrite the history books and redefine the art of war like nothing before or since. The art of warfare would be unrecognizable today were it not for a thousand-year-old Chinese invention. The first we hear about gunpowder in ancient China is actually from philosophical Taoist tracts. Uh, these were scientists looking for elixirs of immortality, and what they found was in fact the exact opposite. The art of warfare was changed forever. The introduction of gunpowder was the first time that any kind of energy other than human muscle had been applied to warfare. Until that time, everything had to be done by either human or animal muscle. Gunpowder harnessed chemical energy, which could be released over a very short period of time, and gave that enormous power into the hands of the military. The first place that that happened was China. But how is this world-changing substance made? It turns out to be a fairly simple recipe. John Naylor is an expert in the history of military hardware. The basis of gunpowder and any sort of explosive is the fuel. In this case, the fuel is charcoal. We need to powder it, grind it down. In fact, it often works best to have a mixture of coarse and fine powdered charcoal. Powdered charcoal is mixed with two other common chemicals in precise proportions. Mixed together and ground very carefully, you end up with your black powder. The bowl and spoon John is using are made of pure silver. John cannot risk using steel or any other metals that can spark when banged together. The reason is obvious. The three of them combined, mixed together, turn innocuous chemicals into the driving force of warfare for nearly a thousand years. 
Having stumbled upon the ultimate ingredient for weapons of war, China realized its potential and launched large-scale production. The first evidence of industrial production of gunpowder in China is dated to 1040 AD, and initially not for use as an explosive, but rather as a fire-producing compound. Gunpowder has different properties depending on the exact proportion of its ingredients, and early varieties of gunpowder didn't explode, but they simply burnt at varying speeds. So that the, the most useful application at that date was either as an incendiary thrown um, from a catapult inside a, a soft paper casing that would burst into flames on impact, or a match which would continue to burn quite slowly for several hours and could be held in front of a, of a stream of, of inflammable oil. With the right mix of gunpowder, military engineers developed a sparky fuse that would lead to the emergence of a new and terrifying weapon, the flamethrower. When the flamethrower was first used by the Germans in the First World War, it came as a, a terrible surprise to the Allies and was regarded as, as a, a particularly horrific example of, of the way that modern warfare was going. Um, I think it would have been a surprise to anyone at the time to realize that flamethrowers had been in use for nearly a thousand years in China. Throwing or projecting fire was not a new tactic in warfare. Greek fire had been in use for several hundred years before that, but the Chinese advance on this was to produce a continuous stream of flammable liquid this ancient flamethrower was among the first to utilize liquid fuel. This flamethrower is from the Song Dynasty. It was made to use gasoline, which had been used in China very early on. The liquid properties of gasoline meant it could be sprayed out of a nozzle. This was then ignited at the muzzle by a piece of slow match impregnated with gunpowder. So this was not only the first continuous action flamethrower, but it was also the first known use of gunpowder uh, in military technology. In a remote location somewhere in rural England, we are about to test a replica of this ancient weapon. Richard Windley is an ancient technology expert who is intrigued by the design of the gunpowder fuse. Certainly the ignition details we have for the flamethrower from the original text indicate that it was some kind of very slow burning but sparky fuse which gave plenty of sparks but burned relatively slowly. It'd be no good having a fuse that burned quickly because it would just burn away and there wouldn't be enough um, ignition there for the thing to keep up a continuous stream. But what flammable agent would the ancient Chinese pyro commandos have used in their weapons? We think that what they were using was something similar to gasoline or, or kerosene. So um, what I'm actually using in this device is a mixture of the two. With the chemistry of the fuse and the incendiary understood, Richard researched the ancient texts for clues as to how the flamethrower actually worked. So this is uh, our reconstruction of the uh, Chinese flamethrower. Basically what we have is a brass cylinder. The quality of the brass was actually specified in the original document and this forms the cylinder of a pump. Inside here is a piston, which is about so big. This would probably be made out of bronze or possibly wood, and it would be bound round with cord until it was a really snug, tight fit in the cylinder so we can get plenty of pressure. This moves backwards and forwards as the handle is moved backwards and forwards. On the forward stroke, it, it forces out the flammable liquid through a nozzle at the front of the device, and on the back stroke, it forces the fluid which is in here it forces that down through that pipe there, up through an internal pipe here, and to a secondary nozzle at the front. So we're effectively getting two squirts, one on the forward stroke and one on the backward stroke. At the back of the flamethrower is a large diameter extension to the cylinder, and this forms what we'd now call a gland. This would have been packed with string or cardboard, and the purpose of this is to stop the fluid on the back stroke being forced out and covering the operator. The reservoir is in the bottom. Initially, uh, in the original device, the whole thing, this whole tank, would have been a large reservoir, which would probably be holding something like 25 litres. There is a small flap valve made of brass, which has a pivoted hinge. This allows the fuel to be drawn up into the cylinder on the forward push and along this tube, rather than back into the reservoir on the second stroke and into the secondary nozzle ignition chamber at the front. The ignition system is a slightly different uh, proposal because the texts are not that clear on how exactly this worked. 
the little um, fuse assemblies are going to fit just inside the little holder there. Uh, they're ready to be lit. The front portion, the ignition chamber goes on. Then what all remains to do now is to light the fuse and uh, we're ready, pretty much ready to shoot. Richard sets up a bale of hay 60 feet away from the flamethrower. This will enable us to see how accurate the weapon is. The flamethrower fires burning gasoline over 60 feet and instantly incinerates the target Richard has set up, a devastating weapon of war. Well, um, that, that, from where I was standing, that was absolutely staggering. That was awesome. And um, to see that, that stream of fire coming at you must be absolutely devastating. So where was the best tactical position to place a flamethrower? They, they were used in a whole host of different ways. They were used on board ship. They were used um, on ramparts as defences for fortifications and almost act as a kind of spearhead for the frontline troops. We know from 20th century experience that the flamethrower is one of the most terrifying weapons that anyone can face. And certainly there would have been a serious risk of being burnt if you were in front of it. But they were fairly short-ranged weapons. And a lot of the time their value would have been psychological. If a flamethrower of, of that description was, was guarding a breach in a city wall, it would have been a very brave man who would have attempted to go through it. But many military objectives are further away than 60 feet. There is amazing evidence that the Chinese designed and built weapons that could fire devastating projectiles over a mile. Before the advent of gunpowder in China in 1000 AD changed the art of warfare, the Chinese had long been shooting projectiles across battle lines using the crossbow. But there is intriguing evidence that the Chinese military engineers took crossbow technology to its ultimate limit. In Chinese archives lies a rare copy of an ancient text, The Essentials of the Military Arts, written in the 11th century. It is a magnificent document on ancient Chinese warfare. Within its pages are fascinating glimpses of complex and awe-inspiring machines. One such machine was the triple crossbow, an incredibly powerful siege weapon. The triple crossbow was a 25-foot long device that employed not one, but three bows to give it extreme power. This was a heavy-duty assault weapon that needed a whole team of men just to arm the beast. This is the largest long-range weapon. The original model would be twice as big, twice as long as this model. Mostly it's used to defend, but it could certainly be used for attack. It has fierce power from these triple bows. It would take ten soldiers or more to turn the axle and to load the string on the trigger. But what kind of ordnance could this monster unleash? The arrows for the siege crossbow were huge. They were made from iron and could fly as far as a mile. These 10-foot full metal jacket tipped missiles would have smashed through anything they met. But despite its gargantuan size, the siege crossbow was a mobile and versatile weapon. The giant siege weapon was mounted on a pivot and axle, allowing it to be targeted quickly and with precision. Once the weapon had a target in its sights, the power straining to unleash the missile would be freed by banging the trigger with a hammer. The ability to threaten a town with a single weapon provoked a rush to develop countermeasures and defenses within Chinese city walls. And where the defenders built higher and wider, the aggressors built taller and stronger. Perhaps the most effective of the ancient Chinese siege attack weapons was the whirlwind catapult. Acting like a heavy-duty sniper rifle, 
the whirlwind could release a projectile with pinpoint accuracy at any part of the town wall or its inhabitants. Western siege catapults of the time worked by pulling down a massive weight, loading the projectile, and then releasing the weight. The whirlwind was different. There was no weight. Instead, a squad of 10 men would pull down on the short end of the lever, hurling the 120-pound ball up to a quarter of a mile. This meant that the whirlwind was a very light and mobile multiple-use weapon and could be deployed anywhere around a siege or even in open battle. But there's more. Western catapults needed a solid frame to support the great weight. The elite whirlwind catapult was supported by just a single pole. This gave it another advantage. The advantage of the whirlwind catapult was the mobility and flexibility that it provided, in contrast to the larger siege engines, which were basically static. A whirlwind catapult could be mounted on a tower or a city wall and used to command a very wide arc of fire. Or alternatively, on the battlefield, it could be rushed quickly to any place where massed firepower was required. In ancient texts, there are accounts of whirlwinds forming parts of batteries of thousands of catapults, which could lay devastation to entire cities within hours. But the purpose of a siege was not always to obliterate the enemy town. Often, the objective was to overrun the city with infantry. There is evidence in the texts of large assault machines known as cloud bridges. Their name might sound peaceful, but their purpose was anything but. This 10% scaled down model is one that incorporates an extendable ladder. The ancient Chinese invented this siege machine with the name Cloud Bridge, meaning very tall bridge. It has wheels and it could be pushed forward until it reached the wall. Soldiers could safely hide inside the machine until the wall was reached. Stepping on this ladder, the city walls could be climbed onto. You can imagine in a battle scores of cloud bridges being pushed forward and hundreds or thousands of soldiers climbing the ladders. Cloud bridges were really powerful in ancient wars. And some of the cloud bridges were truly massive, driven by teams of oxen. The main point of this type of machine is to get attacking troops on top of the city wall. So it was obviously important as the height of walls increased, that the, the height of the machines was increased to match them. But no weapon of war is invincible. The normal way of attacking this kind of wooden siege engine was obviously to set it on fire. Um, this could be done simply by throwing burning materials at it, or in a later period by the use of burning oil or flamethrowers. So the logical counter was to cover the machine with uncured hides which would be very difficult to burn, keep them soaked with water, um, and in that way armor them and the people inside against missiles at the same time as you make them fireproof. And if the attackers breached the city walls, there were lethal defenses waiting for them. The ancient world's equivalent of razor wire. This battle machine is called a San Yuan knife cart. It's a two-wheeled cart installed with knives. Its major function is in the eventuality that the gates failed to hold or the city walls were breached. It would be rolled into place to block up streets and defend them. The knife cart was as effective as razor wire, with one improvement. It was mobile and could be deployed wherever the defender's need was greatest. But just like razor wire, it could fit any gap. In the ancient wars, a practical cart was built according to the size of gates or width of streets. I think it would be twice the size of this, at least. But not all heavy military hardware was used in urban conflict. At first sight, it might look like it was designed to scale city walls, but this machine had a more intriguing purpose. This is a military machine used in ancient Chinese warfare with the name nest cart. It is actually a small house that can be lifted up and down to scout. 
In the middle area of China, the lands are mainly flat, which makes it difficult to see far on the enemy's side. With this device, we could see the enemy's situation from high. Military satellites fill the tactical role of the nest cart in modern warfare. However, there are ancient Chinese weapons that were developed nearly a millennium ago, whose basic technology is little changed from that used by our armed services today. The Chinese innovated the greatest revolution in warfare technology the world has ever seen, the gun. The range and ingenuity of Chinese weapons of war is incredible, but it wasn't until the invention of gunpowder that Chinese military hardware entered the modern era and ancient Chinese armies began to use a weapon that would be recognizable to the modern soldier. By the 10th century, weapons called fire lances, bamboo tubes filled with kinds of gunpowder mixed with fragments of iron, ceramic shards, things like that. They were set fire to, you advance towards the enemy, and these things spit fire and various bits of poison ceramics. At the same time, new compositions of gunpowder were being developed, which produced much more explosive force and less in the way of, of flames. And when these were combined with the, the principle of the projectile being forced out of a barrel, the result was the development of the gun. In the National Military Museum in Beijing lies a stunning weapon the world's first handgun. Made in the Shisheng period in 1351, this extraordinary weapon shows characteristics of a modern firearm, including the clearly visible muzzle and firing chamber. The invention of gunpowder weapons certainly revolutionized Chinese warfare, but it did far more than that. Within 40 years, the same technology had spread all the way from China to the west of Europe. And in fact, the use of gunpowder as a propellant, as a weapon, revolutionized world warfare. This is an example of a Chinese gun, probably of the 16th or 17th century, but it's a wrought iron construction with hooped staves around the barrel. And this type of gun appears really very, very early in China. You can see at the center, there's a thickened breech section to reinforce the barrel against the blast as the main charge goes off. And you can see the touch hole where light's applied to it. A fuse would be placed into the hole. When this fuse was lit, it would carry the flame into the breech of the weapon. Inside, the packed gunpowder would explode violently. The entire force of the explosion had nowhere else to go other than to force the projectile out of the long tube towards the hapless target. The bullet is projected out of the gun with incredible force. The same principle which is used in the, the early handguns which have been found um, from medieval China can be applied to very much bigger weapons, um, including cannon large enough to batter down city walls. This is the earliest tube-shaped metal gunpowder weapon in the world. It was made in the year 1332 and is the grandfather of all modern cannons. The calibers and length of the tubes have become bigger through the development of the cannon. This means it can support heavier bombs and bigger trajectories, and the damage done by the cannon becomes bigger and bigger. But the devastation caused by an explosion can be employed as a method of attack in itself the bomb. There is evidence in ancient texts that the Chinese invented explosive devices with triggering mechanisms nearly 1,000 years ago. A new discovery is forcing us to go back and rewrite the history books. There was an ancient Chinese weapon tactically identical to a device used on the battlefields of Vietnam. Could the Chinese have invented the landmine? Most people would expect that a, a landmine would be um, an innovation of the 20th century. But in fact, something very similar was in use in China as early as the 13th century. And by the 15th, it had been developed into a very sophisticated device which could be set off by the pressure of a person's foot. 
Um, this would release a pin, which would release a weight underground and set off a, a flint and steel detonator. Um, and this would explode a large piece of bamboo stuffed full of gunpowder right underneath the enemy soldier's feet. This would send shards of bamboo and other shrapnel exploding upwards and through the feet of the enemy, rendering them immobile. But devices like the handgun and the landmine were only possible because the Chinese had a long tradition of creating technologically advanced weapons of war. Over 1,500 years before the landmine and the handgun, Chinese metallurgists were already producing devastating attack weapons. One of these was the high-intensity crossbow. The crossbow is responsible for countless victories in Chinese history, and there were millions of them issued to infantry troops. However, because they are made of wood, surviving crossbows are priceless, rare artifacts. This is an example of one of the very earliest Chinese crossbows. It's just the stock made of wood covered in lacquer and beautifully decorated. It's the trigger mechanism that's at the heart of the Chinese crossbow, and it's an extremely clever device. Triggers are made of extremely precise interconnecting components that must fit and work together with rigorous accuracy. To manufacture them required an incredibly advanced level of casting expertise. And in fact, the technology is quite comparable with a lot used in the gun trade a millennium and a half later. Yet these things were invented in the fourth century BC. The crossbow was a significant technological development over the simple bow that was used for thousands of years by civilizations all over the world. But how is this design more effective than the simple bow? The ordinary bow is formed by an arc and a bowstring. It's pulled by hand, and as a result, the bowman would get tired using it. It's also hard to aim. But the Chinese crossbow is mounted on a frame, and the string is pulled back and held in position by a latch attached to a trigger mechanism. The trigger mechanism could be conceived as the ancestor of the trigger from a modern rifle. The trigger mechanism would enable the bow to be held ready-armed for long periods without tiring the archer, and thus taking aim would be easier. This gives the crossbow an important tactical advantage over other bows. The most significant advantage of the crossbow is that soldiers could use it for ambush. Once they discovered and aimed at targets, they would simply need to pull the trigger. Then the arrow would fly out with incredible power. It only demands the small force of pulling the trigger with a finger, and it would be transformed into a really big force to shoot out the arrow. And when released, the two-pound bolt could fly 300 yards towards the enemy, tearing through armor, flesh, and bone. Crossbow technology and the skill of crafting these elegant assault weapons has not been lost. Yang Fuxi comes from a long family line of crossbow makers that dates back nearly two and a half thousand years. He still makes bows to an ancient design, using only the tools and materials available to the ancients. I couldn't tell you how many generations in my family have been making bows. My ancestors were all bow makers. This looks exactly the same as a crossbow excavated from a West Han tomb. This is a Han Nu crossbow. In Chinese, this means with anger. Its history can be traced back to 2,500 years ago. This replica was made exactly according to ancient drawings. The trigger on this crossbow is made of bronze and exactly the same as the one excavated. Many modern tools were used like lathes, mills, and planes. Our ancestors could make these exquisite triggers thousands of years ago without modern tools. Through the process of creating these beautiful replicas, Yang Fuxi has discovered a tactical benefit of the crossbow. The leather strips bound on the chocks are to fasten the bow. The bow can be disassembled to make it convenient to carry on military marches, and then reassembled on the battlefield. But how powerful could a crossbow get 
and what was its ultimate range. According to ancient texts, the most powerful crossbow could have a tensile force of up to 260 pounds. It was called crossbow loaded with feet. It could reach over 500 yards. Very deadly. This devastatingly lethal attack weapon could fire 20-inch bolts at the enemy, with a force equivalent to being hit in the chest with a modern 357 bullet. But the Chinese military were continuously developing and refining their arsenals. By 200 AD, they had taken the crossbow to a new lethal level. Centuries before the gun, while the rest of the world relied on the simple bow, the Chinese developed the world's first repeating shooting weapon, the repeating crossbow. It is the ancient world's machine gun. Here on top, we've got a magazine that holds these bolts, slotting down into there like that. Holding this lever, working the action, the whole magazine comes forward. The string slips into that notch, so it can then be drawn back. It's also holding down a little peg so that when the magazine is steady on the stock, pushes the peg, wallop, shoots the projectile down at the enemy. And as fast as you can work the action, that's how fast you can shoot. With 100 men to a company, 10 companies to a regiment, each with 1,000 crossbows, this meant that six or 7,000 bolts would have been tearing across the battlefield at once, instantly cutting down everything in their path. Incredibly, this murderous kill rate would not be seen again until World War I, over 1,500 years later. Now, the beauty of this weapon is it's idiot-proof. You don't need to be a trained soldier to use it. It gives the rate of fire that a trained archer can put out, but without all the hardship of learning to do it. It was common at the time for Chinese emperors to have retained armies. This meant that farmers, who usually worked the lands of the empire, could be called upon to take up arms in defense of their realm. The repeating crossbow was an ideal weapon to issue to an untrained soldier. Thousands of these weapons unleashed onto the battlefield would put doubt in the minds of any attacking force. Firing at a rate of one lethal bolt per second, the repeating crossbow was a unique development an innovation that, incredibly, preceded the automated weapons of the 20th century by more than 15 centuries. Although a single bolt from a repeating crossbow would not cause enormous impact, the effect of thousands of them coming at once would have been devastating, especially if we consider that the tips would have been poisoned. A single scratch would have taken out an enemy soldier. But it wasn't until they unleashed the chemical energy in gunpowder that the Chinese brought the firing of missiles across the battlefield into the modern era. By the 11th century AD, the Chinese were starting to project missiles in a way that would be recognizable to a modern military engineer in the gunpowder-fueled rocket. Gunpowder was first used for military purposes in China around 1000 AD. Its initial use in warfare was to create fuses for flamethrowers. But the flamethrower's range is limited by how far the machine can pump the flammable fluid. However, the Chinese had been using the explosive power of gunpowder in fireworks for entertainment. They also had hundreds of years' experience of unleashing projectiles at an enemy. It was just a matter of time before they discovered you could combine these two skills. An intriguing discovery by underwater archaeologists off the coast of Japan has uncovered evidence of what are believed to be China's earliest known exploding gunpowder-based projectiles. The researchers found something stunning, two intact and four partial bombs encased in a dense ceramic shell. When the scientists x-rayed two of the intact bombs, they discovered that one was filled with gunpowder, and the other not only contained gunpowder, but dozens of pieces of iron shrapnel. They realized what they were looking at, a weapon that was half bomb, half grenade. 
We now know that ancient Chinese armies had an incredible range of ordnance available to them. From super scale mega crossbows, to handguns and cannons, to devastating flamethrowers, all being deployed nearly a thousand years ago. But now, for the first time, new discoveries have us asking the incredible. Could the Chinese have used rocket-propelled missiles in battle at a time when the rest of the world was throwing stones out of wind-up catapults? In its early years, gunpowder was used mostly for entertainment. They designed spectacular fireworks, almost the same as we use on the 4th of July today. But could this expertise be turned to use in battle? Could the Chinese adapt their rocket technology and create self-propelled weapons of war? Under the Song Dynasty in the 13th century, they were still used only for toys and for firework demonstrations. But soon after that, they began to have a military application. This was well before the use of rockets in warfare anywhere else in the world. The early applications of rocket technology to military uses were basic. They involved attaching a gunpowder-based rocket to an arrow to give the projectile propulsion. Intriguingly, there is evidence of early trials in which rockets were attached to aerodynamic bird-shaped creations. But developments were right around the corner. Under the Ming Dynasty from the middle of the 14th century, rockets began to be used en masse in Chinese warfare. They were fairly small devices with arrowheads on the end of a stick propelled by a rocket tube. They didn't have explosive warheads, so they were most useful when fired en masse. Just like the multiple rocket launchers of today, Chinese rocket launchers caused devastation on the battlefield. And it didn't stop there. There was an invention that took rocket technology to the ultimate limit a piece of military hardware little different to the rockets that modern armed forces put into the field today, the ballistic missile. Invented in the early 14th century, even its name was designed to strike fear into enemy troops. This is an ancient weapon called Fire Dragon issued from water. It was used in naval battles, and when issued, it had a long flame tail, looking like a fire dragon. There are many types of bamboo in China, so it's easy to find the material to build the weapon's body. But how did it work? It has something like fireworks attached to the outside, which act like a powder flask when they are lit. The whole thing starts to fly. The mouth in the front is loaded with gunpowder, which explodes the enemy ship. But there was more to the weapon than that. The rocket was built in two stages. During the flying, the first stage burns, but ignites the second stage. This drives the fire dragon to fly further and reach the enemy ship and explode. But even if the enemy was out of range, the Fire Dragon had a contingency. There was a magazine of three rocket-driven arrows loaded within the mouth of the missile. Hundreds of Fire Dragons flying through the air at an enemy fleet would have caused panic and devastation. This Fire Dragon issuing from the water might be thought of as a sort of primitive cruise missile. Its main use was from one ship um, against an enemy fleet in naval battles, battles on the, the large rivers of China. Um, I think, though, that it, its main impact would have been psychological. The large carved and painted dragon head on the front would probably have had more impact than the, the shower of arrows which it was, uh, discharged when it got within range. Um, nevertheless, it's, uh, it's an extremely sophisticated piece of technology for its time. It is incredible to think that the Chinese war machine created weapons whose principles and tactics we still use today. The, those first Chinese um, military technicians who first used gunpowder to propel a rocket device forward um, can take as much credit as anyone for putting a man on the moon. Thousands of years ago, they were creating weapons that would be instantly recognizable to the modern soldier. 
What new discoveries remain out there? Discoveries that will turn everything we thought we knew about the ancient world on its head. Will we have to rewrite the history books?